Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we are discussing the central role of African-American leaders and museums in illustrating the history, art, and culture of Americans who are descended from diverse peoples of Africa with special guests. Terry Lee Friedman, uh, Executive Director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African-American History and Culture, and Lanisha debar Delaven, President and CEO of the Northwest African-American Museum in Seattle. Thank you both for joining us. This is just so wonderful. I am so excited, and I must confess that I have a special, special love for uh, for the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, having uh, worked for, for your board uh, previously, but also I was born in Baltimore, so... Uh, Terry, <laughs> I'm going to go over to you. And and uh, Lanisha, I'm so, so uh, happy that you're here. I have a very special place in my heart for Seattle, which is just north from where I am in San Francisco. Definitely. We're happy to be here. So 20,000 American cultural institutions teach about American history in this country. And there are only about 110 such institutions like yours that are dedicated to teaching about African American, the African American experience. So I want to go to you, Terry, and mm-hmm. give, giving you the the hometown the town advantage. <laughs> um, so why is it important? You know, I'm I'm of European extraction, right? My wife is of Philippine extraction. Mm-hmm. My friends are, you know. South Asian, East Asian extraction. Why is it important that all these individuals who are not of African-American extraction understand much more about the African-American history uh, of this country and the culture and the contributions of African-Americans to the America that we have today? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you, uh, Mark, for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And I'm honored to be here with Lanisha, um, who has done an awful lot of work in Washington around her particular uh, museum. So I can't wait to hear her say more. Um, But it is that every person has their own experience. And the fact of the matter is that African-Americans, while not by choice, Uh, were in this country basically from its founding, right? Um, Not because we wanted to be here, but because we were stolen from our homeland and brought to this this new land um, to actually develop the land in, in many ways, shapes, and forms. So to assume that the only history is the history that is told to us from a white male perspective is an inaccurate history. Um, Africans that were brought to America had a a real experience here. They made real contributions here. And it is critical that people understand the entire story of what is American history, not African-American history, not white American history, but American history, because this country could not stand as we now know it, were it not for um, the Africans that were brought from their homeland, but also for the Native Americans um, who were in these spaces and places. So to get the full picture, we need to talk to everybody and make sure that they are represented in the story. And we know you know, as the story is told is as the story will be remembered. So we have to make sure that we are telling the right story. And Maryland is such an interesting case because the first kidnapped peoples came from Africa in 1642. Mm -hmm. And then if you take a look at um, African-American leaders who have shaped this country, Maryland has just a few. (laughs) Just just a few. You you know, it's, It has a Maryland, and and this particular museum is really um, Maryland, African-American history. And I'm sure some people would say, well, Maryland is this little teeny weeny state, and how does it have that much history? Well, you know, Maryland is one of the oldest of the colonies, if you will, and it developed alongside of the country. And Maryland was a border state, so it had this really kind of... um, um, weird way of developing with the largest number of free Blacks in any one place in Baltimore 
yet they lived alongside of enslaved um, African Americans. And we also know that um, it was not uncommon for folks from the South to come to the North or up South, let me put it that way, which is what uh, Maryland is, up South, uh, and steal people who were actually free and take them back down South. So the, Maryland had a very, very interesting um, history as the, the nation developed. And we had, as you said, Harriet Tubman from the Eastern Shore, uh, Frederick Douglass from um, enslaved in Baltimore. He moved to Massachusetts, but enslaved in Baltimore and, and got his freedom and, and um, up, up to Massachusetts. And, you know, then you go further into history and you have people like Thurgood Marshall and, um, um, uh, you know, Hamilton Houston and others who have been so significant in um, uh, Banneker creating this nation and um, some of the architects of some of the most important um, pieces of what we consider um, our nation's founding. So Maryland is a really interesting um, state in the entire um, ecosystem, if you will, of African-American history. And Washington equally interesting, right? Uh, a, a younger state, um, a state that was connected to um, the rest of, of the states through the railway systems that were built uh, largely by uh, African-American, Chinese, and other immigrant labor. Uh, talk a little bit, Lanisha, about um, how you see the museum in the ecosystem of museums that explain the African-American experience uh, over, over uh, in Seattle. Mark, it's so good to be here with you and with my dear friend and sister Terry, who is a trailblazer in every way. Uh, you know, Black museums from coast to coast are telling stories that are not being told in other spaces in society. These stories that we're telling are not being told in textbooks in schools and in um, other settings. Black museums are spaces where truth telling information can be discovered by all. We are all at the same level of learning and self-discovery in Black museums. And here at the Northwest African American Museum in Seattle, we are telling those stories of uh, pioneering innovation that African Americans um, explored, endured, created here. Uh, for Seattle to have established, for instance, an NAACP chapter as early as 1913 and 1914 in Portland, Oregon. I mean, these were pioneering uh, social justice and civil rights activists. The well, fact that labor, Seattle labor activists as well, right? The uh, the uh, African American leaders of the labor movement were so incredibly important, in, in particular in a in a state like Washington and a state like Portland. Absolutely, there has been a long tradition of activism and. Um, or progressive uh, interracial um, uplift taking place here in the far West. And Black museums here are preserving those stories and educating and bringing people together in a way that uh, is gonna move the society toward equity, we believe. The thing that I think is also very interesting is if you take a look at the Reginald uh, F. Lewis Museum, which is named for the first African-American billionaire um, who incidentally um, bought one of my uncle's companies uh, years ago. Um, it's, it's really interesting how um, through this uh, persistence, through uh, education very often undercover, through the development of culture, that you've taken people whose own memory of where they came from was systematically destroyed and suppressed, the different cultures that people came out of Sub-Saharan Africa largely, um, then they, they were able to reestablish cultures that were very regional, that were very unified, and that resulted in uh, a social cohesion that 
now is finding expression in 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 the uh, in the greater culture of the United States. Right. <laughs> Earlier, it was jazz. Now it's hip hop. And now it's, you know, and, and other musical forms. But you've got this this whole idea of of how do you create your own identity forged out of destruction? Right, Terry? I, I, you know, ours has always been an oral tradition. Um, and we brought that over from um, Africa with, with a tradition of passing down stories orally from one generation to the next. And we continued that even during enslavement to ensure that the stories were told that people had some memory of culture. And of course, as we've gone through additional generations, some of that has been watered down, but in other instances, it has not been. And the oral tradi tradition today is very, very strong. So as you're talking about this whole idea of culture creators, um, I personally believe um, that Black people have been culture creators through, through time. We have that we have brought. To, we have. It, it's almost like um, you know the, the the Bible talks about people being the salt of the earth, giving flavor. Um, black people have always taken what was given to them and then morphed it into something that was different and and something that other people actually wanted. We've done it with food. We've done it with music. We've done it with art. Um, and we continue to do that. And um, this particular community in Baltimore, I think, is a, a, a very creative community. Uh, a much many makers are here in this community. And to to not recognize those contributions still, um, we are um, we are being short sighted. And we are not allowing people to have the breadth and richness of community. And one of the things that I have found is you talked about jazz and you talked about hip hop. Um, these are music forms that everyone is, uh, you know, partaking in. It's not just black people, but that extra flavor that blacks have always brought to whatever that situation was, is a part of what creates culture. So Terry was talking about story stories, Lanisha, this whole idea of an oral uh, tradition. What kind of stories do you highlight in your museum um, for someone just walking in for the first time? You know, one thing that our museum did was created a traveling choir, a musical ensemble to lift these stories that we tell off of the wall and to pop up in community and to tell these stories through music rhythm and rhyme, talk about jazz and hip hop. We, we created this living arts experience and uh, we're a storytelling institution through music. And so our African-American cultural ensemble is telling the stories of our ancestors, the sort of from enslavement to modern day social justice activism. You mean you're challenging the standard rules of how a museum should operate? Oh my goodness. <laughs> In every stop, stop. way. <laughs> so so what you're doing is you're you're giving people a, an experience that is more three dimensional. It's really more the way we communicate. Right. Oral traditions, music, the, the sort of the the entering into a culture as opposed to just witnessing it hanging on the walls. Right. And these stories really stick with people. When you put a story to music, it that that tune does not go away. Mm -hmm. And so we are just empowering and inspiring people with the truth of our history in a way that they can relate to mm -hmm. and in a way that brings people together. They find enjoyment um, and sometimes, you know, challenge. They're challenged to think differently through this medium of music. And I, you know, I think that I'm sorry, uh, Mark, I just want to add it, that I do believe that um, music is also one of those things that brings people together. Right. And people like music. Um, but we've also learned that there are other ways in addition to music and dance and, you know, even um, visual art that is being created in museums on the spot. Um, we've also learned from our colleagues in the children's museum sector that people being able to interact with things, to be able to touch things, to be able to create things, um, helps them also um, better learn the story and better 
keep the story uh, because they're actually interacting with it. So we're doing an exhibit right now on Afrofuturism. Um, and the, the main exhibit will be done through art and through music. Um, we came up with a, um, a Spotify playlist of songs that are uh, futuristic. And then they can go down to the lower level um, um, Imaginarium where they can actually think about what's the future that they would create for Black people as we move forward. So they get to write, they get to draw, they get to connect to different people's thoughts. And it's, it's really a different type of look at what we think museums are and how we tell these stories. You're also taking a constraint and you're making it into a benefit. Material culture of African-American peoples have throughout history um, been destroyed or been disrespected, right? You see that with the earlier views of, of the art of quilt making, for example, which now has become much more accepted and embraced as, as a true uh, art form and, and uh, cultural storytelling. But um, there is a lot that has been destroyed over the years because people who do not have very much um, and people who have been under attack for their culture um, end up having a lot of objects destroyed. How do you deal with the uh, the fact that it's difficult to find uh, objects that have been preserved of cultural significance to display other than through storytelling? You know, that is a challenge, Mark. And one thing that we have created uh, at the museum here is, is a youth curator program to ensure that young people are trained in um, preservation and education of, of our culture, of our history. And so we have had a youth curator program for the last 15 years. And, and in the more recent years, they have been producing animations of African-American history and culture. And so when, when there is material culture, even when there is not, there is still a legacy to be preserved and to be shared. And so our youth curators are creating literally cartoon characters. They're being trained on how to produce an animation that tells the story uh, in a way that their peers uh, can relate to and can enjoy and can learn from. And so this is, uh, this is the second year of their uh, Black History cartoon animation training. Well, this is, this is a, a place where everyone can become a hero of, of being an advocate for a uh, cultural heritage, being an advocate for, for uh, knowledge transfer and being an advocate for respect. We just asked um, for full understanding of American history, is it important that every American also have a grounding in the history, art and culture of African-Americans? And 100% of the people who responded, now, mind you, we have a select audience here, um, said, absolutely, it is, it is absolutely um, uh, um, uh, critical uh, for, uh, to do that. I want to ask you about the culture wars, because I know that, that we're all inundated with this idea uh, coming out of, out of uh, Florida in particular, where uh, there is this uh, sense that uh, state governments, in that particular case, the Florida state government, is, is uh, objecting to the teaching of African-American history as uh, put together by academics. Um, Talk a little bit about how you see this act within a historical context, uh, because your museums are talking about the history of interactions um, between different segments of, Amer uh, of America and African Americans. Uh, Lanisha, what do you what do you see? How do you respond to that type of of uh, opposition? To, to certain types of stories being shared with young people. I go to the wise words of our ancestors, those who came before, who saw this before, before us. This is not the first time. It's not you. Exactly, exactly. So I think about um, the words of James Baldwin, who said that, you know, history is something that we can't escape. We can't deny it. We can't cut it off of uh, the curriculum. We are inextricably, you know, controlled by this history. We are a part of this history. And so when we are striving to uh, deny 
the history to deny this this American path that we've been on together. We're in a sense engaged in self denial as a society, and that is never a good thing. And so um, we have to continue to rise up and and persist in being inclusive in our history telling. Should my six year old be Terry, should my six-year-old know that that certain people were enslaved by certain other people? Absolutely. Um, I, I don't understand why we wouldn't. We don't have to um, t- terrorize our young people, nor do we have to blame anyone. But the facts are the facts. And the fact of the matter is that we did not choose to come to this country. We were identified as property and being able to work the land to make sure that the land was as profitable as it could be for a particular group of people. Those are the facts. Now, many years have gone by um, and things are different to some degree, but it's also important for the six-year-old to know that there are differences in experiences in how you know, how one person's day is when they wake up and come to school and how another person's day is when they wake up and come to school and that that's okay. We can have differences and we can have same experiences, but each of us are individual and our each of our experience, experiences count. That's what I think is the most offensive part of what is going on in Florida is that the suggestion is that my history has no worth. It has no value. We're going to continue to teach history. We're just not going to teach your history. What because- you're basically saying is that is that if you start from the idea of facts, right? Now, you might teach different lessons to a six-year-old that you would teach to a 16-year-old that you would teach to a 26-year-old. Mm-hmm. But you start with the facts and you and you teach the facts, right? You scale it for, for the age. Right, right Anisha? I mean, Absolutely. you know, you music because we learn better through music or or whatever it is. But you start with facts. You don't suppress facts, right? And that's the beauty of African American museums. We are a resource. And we have resources to make this history accessible, understandable, and relatable to people of all generations, from you know early readers to elders. And so uh, Black museums are such gems for um, cultural and educational empowerment. We have a role to play. I also think that we are are critical for for, um, our convening um, ability, our ability to bring people together to dialogue about these things that are difficult, these challenges. Um, to answer the questions that people may have about, well, why would we want to suppress certain parts of history? You know, to have that conversation in what, you know, there are just a few public spaces and places where people can go to actually have these types of dialogues, museums being one, libraries being another, um, that don't have a, if you will, a a necessarily political uh, stance on these issues. And as you said, Mark, it's about the facts. It's how, you know, we, we present the truth um, and, and uh, we, we cannot try to um, change the truth. And that's why museums are so important for the future is that these stories are held within trust in these spaces and places called museums. This is how we are able to make sure that the story is told consistently. Now, you were previously with, in Memphis. What What is your, and it's early days in your, in your trajectory in, in Baltimore, uh, what is your view of the, uh, of the comparative uh, environment between Memphis and, and Baltimore? Well, So uh, the National Civil Rights Museum um, is, we have to recognize that it is a place where history actually took place, right? So it is its own um, uh, history, as opposed to the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, which is a museum that tells a story, but history didn't actually happen here. And so the difference that I found is that Places where history took place become sites for pilgrimage. 
Um, people want to go there to experience that space. The power of the place is significant. The power of the space is significant. It sends a message. There's something you feel viscerally when you are on those grounds where history actually um, occurred. That said, um, I think what the National Civil Rights Museum um, does and the Lewis Museum and the Northwest Museum do is similar in nature. Um, some of the stories may be different based on geography. Um, Memphis is going to focus on the Southern experience. Um, Baltimore is going to focus more, more on that colonial kind of experience. The Northwest, as you spoke of pioneering. But when you put all of it together, it gives us the entire story of the African-American experience and existence in this country. And, and that is so important, right? When I was in Alaska uh, working for the Anchorage Museum, it was really interesting to see the uh, contribution of African-Americans not being from Alaska before I actually um, uh, visited Alaska and began to work for institutions up there. Um, I had no idea of how uh, significant, how really huge the the community um, was in, in Africa. I'd always um, envisioned Africa as being primarily um, native and and um, and mostly uh, white and maybe Asian and so on. But uh, really the the um, the huge uh, impact that um, that uh, uh, black engineers, black workers, black uh, um, uh, leaders of, of all stripes have had in, in in across the country is 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 constantly being manifested, and it's clarified by institutions like yourselves. Um, I have a I have another uh, question. Uh, ex excuse me for for asking all these questions that seem to be uh, permeating this this environment. If we're going to make a change in this country, in terms of of addressing the uh, uh, the the identity of this country as being multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious, multi-orientation. How do we speak about that? How do we cultivate institutions that allow for the dialogue and the increased understanding amongst people who have different backgrounds? Uh, from your perspective, how do we uh, bridge generational divides? How do yeah, we you know. It's, it's important for us to realize that these stories, these realities, these experiences are interwoven. The indigenous experience is interwoven with the African-American experience, which is interwoven with the Asian-American experience, with, which is interwoven with the Latinx experience. I mean, we are truly all in this together. There is this, this tapestry um, of, of, of common, uh, reality, as King said, what affects one uh, directly affects us all indirectly. And so I think having just a, an awareness of our common destiny, um, and it's rooted in a common history. Is it a matter of celebrating difference while also, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say overcoming it, but, but just sort of celebrating difference, but all, uh, but also uh, understanding the commonality here. I mean, the the yeah. the experience that your forebears had of being kidnapped and having their uh, cultures destroyed is very similar to what happened in certain respects to uh, Native peoples here in this country. Um, it's it's very uh, similar to uh, an Asian person who came to this country in the 50s, 60s. And they were told that they were that their cultures were had no significance. Um, isn't it isn't it also true that we have so much in common that we just actually need to, to be talking about it? Right. Well, absolutely. I mean, we know that I think it's something like we are as human beings, we're something like 96 percent the same. And I think it's actually like 98 percent the same. And then you have this two percent that creates the differences um, that we see. But even in the differences that we see. I believe that our desires for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness <laughs> basically are the same. All of us want better for our children. 
All of us want to live in safe communities. All of us want to breathe fresh air and have fresh water. All of us want access to quality education, um, quality cultural experiences. These, these, are, these are common things that human beings want. Our experience, how we got to this point may be different, but it's what's important is that people become aware of these different experiences. And then that we recognize that those differences are what make us such an incredibly interesting um, place and community. That we can have all of these different experiences, yet we can have these, these common interests. And, and the fact that we got away from this whole melting pot idea where we just put everything in, melt it all down to one thing, and you know you have this kind of thin watery soup, and we more look at ourselves now as a, a wonderful stew that has all of these different pieces, and, and, and it's that much more interesting because, oh, I'm going to get a taste of this Latino experience, or, oh, I'm going to better understand. The and Latino. our kids are doing it, right? I mean, the crossover in the culture is just amazing. Absolutely. Let me I'm going to give you the last word, and, and I want to also thank you both for tolerating my ignorance. Will Rogers said that everyone's ignorant only in different subjects. The fact is, is that when we, when we come together like this, you're, you're hearing questions from someone who comes gropingly toward knowledge that you possess. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, with me, and thank you for tolerating my ignorance. That's that's a gift that that you're giving me um, in in terms of of how you're answering these questions uh, that that I'm trying to bring to you from others and also from myself. Anisha, give us give us your final word on how we should think about African American culture in this uh, th this next century. Mark, thank you for having us. It has been a joy for Terry and I to be together and, and with you this morning. You know, I am reminded of uh, a statement that James Baldwin said to Angela Davis in a letter he wrote. He said, if they come for you in the morning, they'll be coming for us in the evening. Therefore, peace. And that is what Black museums are, are all about. They're all about lifting all of us up coming to a greater understanding of this broader American experience so that we can all become our best selves. When there is a void of knowledge, of understanding, there is a void within ourselves. And we're just striving as Black museums to help us all fulfill our highest potential. Every single person in this nation is from made my, better by Black museums. From ideas expressed in part by slaveholding white men to the realization of those ideas by a diverse society, including the descendants of slaves that were held by those white men. The idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is really being fulfilled in storytelling, in the history that you express Terry Lee Friedman, Executive Director, Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland, African-American History, and Lanisha DeBartolavin, President and CEO of the Northwest African-American Museum in Seattle. Thank you so much. Please thank your boards, your staffs, your curators, your volunteers, your singers, uh, Lanisha. Thank you so much for your funders and for your community. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you.